So if computers are so good at rendering things that kind of look 3D, even if you see it in only one eye, what benefits does a true 3D image have? Well, there are a number of 3D cues that are simply not provided by a 2D image. So the first one is stereo or binocular parallax. That is, each eye sees a different image. This is also called stereopsis. And of course, the data that comes from your eyes to your brain are processed in a nearby but kind of interleaved regions in the visual center of your brain. The next one is motion parallax or movement parallax. Uh, if you want to sound fancy, you can call it ego motion. So that is when you move your head, the world seems to sort of change. Nearby things move at a different rate than far away things. The last two things on this list are of particular importance when you're talking about stereo displays. These are called convergence and accommodation. Convergence is how your eyes converge or swivel in and out to focus on the thing that you're looking at. So if you put your finger up in front of your face, you kind of go cross-eyed looking at it. But if you relax and look way off uh, in the distance at infinity, your eyes go parallel again. Now this is related to focus, because of course you focus um, in different ways depending on how far away things are. Living in normal real life, your brain sort of has this mapping, this relationship between what convergence is supposed to go along with what accommodation. But new technologies, such as some stereoscopic viewing techniques or stereo cinema, attempt to break this natural relationship between convergence and accommodation. And that's uncomfortable for some people. For example, if you're at a movie and there's uh, something jutting a few feet or meters outside of the movie screen, your eyes will cross to make it come into view but they're still focusing way back at the screen plane, and that takes a little getting used to. So there's something else here that causes your brain to perceive things as truly 3D, and that's uh, that your eyes can perceive uh, intersecting rays as points. And this is a complicated idea, and it's something that will be covered in the second of three classes. But I think it's important to get your, your brain around this uh, up front. So this is an image that um, I borrowed from the Hollow Video group at the MIT Media Lab several years ago. Some 3D displays work on this technique. Um, there's a rendering step and then a reconstruction step. In the rendering step, a computer will um, depict a scene from, say, 100 different points of view. So you can see here a little box with a red dot on it and an idea of a camera that's moving along a horizontal track. And as it does it, it sees different viewpoints of that scene to reconstruct or play back that image, you would create a display, and that display is composed of a grid of pixels, as you've seen. But there's something unusual about these pixels. These pixels can send light in multiple directions. So whereas your normal pixel on your computer screen is either on or off, uh, these pixels in this fanciful world can steer light in different directions. Why is that useful? Well, in one sense, you could say, if each pixel looks different depending on how you look at it, your two eyes will see different images and therefore you'll perceive 3D. A different um, but sort of equivalent but kind of useful way of looking at it is that you could plot how those rays of light leave those pixels and you'll see they crisscross uh, at each virtual point within that scene. So this is the if you're an engineer and you're trying to develop your own three-dimensional display, this is kind of the problem statement. The problem statement is, how on earth do you create a 3D display where the pixels can emit different amplitudes of light based on different directions leaving the screen? And most of this, uh, the follow-up class, is about just that topic. So let's uh, return to our agenda. The next step here is to learn about some common 3D architectures. Now. There's uh, quite a few, and this is a one slide as sort of a warm-up exercise. The first common 3D display, of course, is stereo headwear that's been around since the mid-1800s, and this causes your eyes very explicitly to see a different left eye image than your right eye image. Um, there are modern equivalents of stereo headwear, such as stereo cinema, or for desktop displays, a head tracking system that even knows where you're sitting. So as you move your head, you can look around objects, and the word for that is horizontal parallax. There are uh, other 3D display techniques that decompose the 3D scene into a variety of different uh, forms. One is to decompose it into uh, discrete viewpoints. So as I showed before, as you move your head around, you could see different images of the scene. 
but that also enables multiple people to see it at once. You could partition the scene into um, cross sections. So what I mean is um, you can have a volumetric display that shows a picture of a brain, but it's kind of collected up like a deck of cards, and each cross section would be one card in that deck. And there's more complex things such as electronic holography. And by the way, the extremes are still areas for open research. Uh, they're a little unusual, but they're still interesting, like exploiting those one-eye or monoscopic cues, or physical instances of a 3D display, such as uh, micro-explosions in a block of plastic that's illuminated. People are doing that. Or dragging a stylus filled with ink around uh, gelatin. Now, let's uh, go one step deeper. Why is it difficult to create? Well, to con consider uh, the difficulty of creating a good 3D display, let's do some simple calculations. Let's say that you want an image that's about a foot by a foot by a foot, 30 centimeters uh, cube on each side, and the image shouldn't flicker, so it will refresh 120 times a second, and people expect good color rendition, so assume it's a 24-bit color system. Well, one type of display to consider is a slice stacking, or volumetric display. Um, the way that would look in a volumetric display is like this. Um, there would be a stack of uh, images, each of which is 2D, with 300 voxels on a side, and there's uh, 300 voxel slices deep. That would require 78 gigabits of optical data per second. An alternative is a multi-view display, such as a lenticular with many, many, many views in it. Um, if you assume 120 degree field of view and one view per degree, that's almost 500 gigabits per second that you need to modulate. And if you think that's hard, some people have suggested doing electronic holography. And if you do it in a really traditional way that kind of mimics traditional display holograms, you'd need, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 line pairs per millimeter. And that relates to 43 terabytes, I'm sorry, 43 terabits per second. Now that assumes full parallax, but people have learned that if you just supply only left-right look around, you can cut that number down quite a bit. So to pull this off, there are a few enabling technologies that became available just, you know, within the last 10 or 15 years. Let's look at those enabling technologies. One of them is a fast light modulator. To make most of these displays, you need a source of light that shines onto something that then shapes or patterns the light, and then that light goes on to strike a screen that's spinning, or the light goes on to go to a flat surface that changes in time in some way. Well, still, uh, as of 2010, just about the only light modulator that's good enough for the job is, for example, the TI-DLP, or Digital Light Processing Technology. Uh, and they can modulate beams anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 or 20,000 frames per second. And some vendors sell control electronics that you can use, such as Violux so that you could send in your bit patterns and the DLP will modulate your photons for you. A second enabling technology is a fast computer. Uh, now this picture is a few years old already, um, but a fast computer that's able to process graphical data or numeric data very fast is called a GPU, uh, Graphics Processing Unit. Um, NVIDIA makes these and AMD ATI makes these. This particular one is the GeForce 8800. It's got 112 little processors in it, all running reasonably fast, and you're able to do real-time calculations of volumetric data or holographic data. Some people even use it to do intense physics calculations for fluid dynamics. Well, that's all great, um, but where's the edge between claims you can believe and claims that you should be suspicious of? For example, there are limits. Uh, on one hand, it is certainly possible to make it seem like a 3D image is just floating above a tabletop, provided that good uh, optics are inside of that tabletop. But there's some things that probably won't happen, at least not with today's physics. For example, the people in this scene can't really look through that image, unless there's some sort of display element where that picture of that planet is. Let's explain this. <laughs> 